Welcome to SelfDiscoveryWisdom.com, formerly known as Self Discovery Media. On these podcasts, you're going to hear people who speak from the heart. They've taken the journey in life. Many things have happened to them, but they've changed it to happening for them. And in their strength, their courage, they've discovered their abilities and their wisdom, and they are now sharing it here with you. Do enjoy each show. We bring it to you with love and knowing that it's going to help you on your journey of life. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Your Health is Your Choice, right here on selfdiscoverywisdom.com. I'm your host, Sarah Troy. My wonderful guest is Michelle Rapkin. We were just talking about her name and how cool it is. And we're going to give you a little rap today. No, we're not. We're going to be talking about how cancer sucks, but you can get through it. This is her book. Now, she is a cancer survivor, and she is an author of The Cancer Sucks, But You Can Get Through It. Um, And it's infused with hope, laughter, advice. Uh, This book uh, curates personal experience with priceless learning from interviews with cancer survivors around the country. It will equip you with the non-medical tools and tips needed to get through cancer treatment sanely. And because surviving cancer and thriving isn't just about medicine, it's about managing your needs emotions, relationships, and more. And Ramkins uh, at the bed, uh, is at the bedside of a friend who gives her the inside scoop into an interview she talked about. So cancer is a cold planet, she says, but it serves a warm guide to help you sidestep and diffuse the buried bombs both around in and around us and this book will help you with invaluable relief as you move through the scariest terrain of your life through someone who has been there and it's not uh, not just once that you've been there my dear right you've had to face that cancer that cancer uh, diagnosis a few times so welcome to the show hun thank you so much i'm happy to be here so is it three times that you've been given that diagnosis? Yes, three times. Um, once in the year 2000, and then I went into remission, and I forgot that I had had it, mm-hmm. but um, it came back very unexpectedly 16 years later in 2017. Then it came back again in 2018. However, I've just entered my fifth year of remission, Excellent. and I feel the right. Great. It, was it always the same cancer that came back or it hit different yes. areas? Um, I, I, yes, it's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Mm. Um, and yes, it's always been the same cancer. Well, you know, we have, to, we have to understand that anything ever happens to our body, whether it's an accident or a disease or anything else, that area is vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And it's subject to, and it's even more important that we maintain a healthy lifestyle, mind, heart, body, spirit, and soul. Because when anything, immune system or any anxiety, you know, dis-ease in in your life comes about, it will go to the most vulnerable area. Interesting. Yes, well, it seems to have done that with (laughs) you. So... The first time you were diagnosed, what was your reaction? Um, Utter shock. I had no symptoms. Mm. My doctor was doing a routine colonoscopy and the camera slipped and he saw something where the camera shouldn't have even been. Ah. And he pursued that. And um, two weeks later called me and said, we think you have cancer. And it was. So I was utterly shocked. I was 47 and I had, I was a newlywed. I did not marry until I was 45. So I just thought this could not be happening, but, um, but it did. And I am here to tell the story 23 years later. Yes. Yes. And yeah, it does suck, doesn't it? You know, it's, um, where we know so much more about it today and also you know that it's not just about your physical treatment it's about your emotional treatment and before we started the show you you know you were talking about that you were newly employed as CEO of managing your cancer Mm -hmm. and I really loved that analogy but would you kind of take us through that approach on it 
Well, you know, um, when I was first diagnosed, I had all kinds of doctor's appointments because actually they needed to do more and more tests to find out whether I did have cancer and then how they were going to treat it. So I went from someone who was in charge of my calendar and my time to being someone who was subject to other people's calendars. So if I had a doctor's appointment, I had to go to that. It didn't matter what time the appointment was. I had to stay until they had done what they needed to do. So I had no control over my time. My body had just betrayed me. I, I remember thinking, I remember thinking, what did I ever do to you that makes you treat me so badly? Um, and, you know, um, there I was in thin gowns waiting for scans. I didn't even have my clothes to, to give me a sense of power. Mm. And I guess I was really feeling that when it suddenly occurred to me that I might not have felt powerful, but I had just been named CEO of a major health concern. Mm. And that was my health. Yes. And that stuck with me. And I thought about that more and more. And honestly, that has served me extremely well through three, uh, three episodes of cancer. And, you know, it's true for cancer, but it's true for yes. anything. If yes. you have, if you have a heart condition, mm -hmm. you're, you're CEO of your health. Mm -hmm. So you have to make choices and you've got to be a good CEO, a good CEO is knowledgeable. A good CEO has done his or her homework and also knows that once you hire, that, that it, the, one of the most important things is hiring a good staff mm. and remembering that, yes, you're hiring experts that know much more than you do in some areas, mm -hmm. but they still are employed by you. And mm -hmm. so if I have a question about a recommendation of the um, doctor or medical staff, I can expect that to get an answer that makes sense to me and to pursue it until I understand it mm -hmm. and not feel like I'm um, inconveniencing them because they're busy. Right. So that concept has really stood me oh, so, so well over the years. Well, I mean, that's the title of the show is your health is your choice, right? Your mm -hmm. body you you're the ceo of you have absolutely every right to say i don't know what you're saying can you speak in layman terms please Correct. right um, Big, you know because some do like to make you feel rather stupid and the higher polluted type words that you don't know and it's that's where the firm what i call the mama voice comes out no mm -hmm. i need to understand i live with me 24 7 you're seeing me five minutes you will explain it <laughs> right, right. I mean, do you have to get firm because we also, you're not just see your advocate for yourself. Correct. Right. So, you know, it's, you're the cheerleader for yourself. You're everything, which it'd be nice to pass some of those things off and you can have some of those things around you, which is important when you're going through anything that you have supporters. And it's important that you know who they are and you can go, okay, I've just got too much on my plate today. I need support. And yeah. sometimes it just may be words, it may be hug, it just may be knowing somebody's there, right? Or helping you with an appointment or something. But I think what happens to a lot of people when they get any form of diagnosis, they retreat in, mm -hmm. right? They're digesting, what does this mean? They start Googling and the next thing you know, their arms are dropping off. You know, it's because it's scary when you do that, when you really don't know the basis of what you're looking for. Well, right? yes. In fact, one of the things that is, absolutely critical is when you you're, you're going to be tempted to go to the internet and do research and that's fine as long as you only go to sites that I have been that you know are have been vetted and are reliable mm -hmm. and have a good reputation um because uh, you know it's important not to, it's important to educate yourself yes you need to educate yourself with the proper information. And you also, as you said, you have to, um, you, you have to educate and also um, listen to your body, listen to your instincts, mm -hmm. 
Um, and so, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a juggling act. It is. And it's knowing what to prioritize when. And then if you've got a good, good support system, you know, you're too much in your head today, or I can feel you're tired. This is a day that I'm going to take over for you. CEO, go and play golf, you know. Uh, you so, and, and you need that team around you that recognizes it. Yes, we want to be in charge. Yes, we want to take some form of control. Because what any di Denise diagnosis is, it feels like it's taking control away from you. Right. right? So we want to have some form of control yes we're handing ourselves over to various medical modalities but at the same time we have every right to know what it is make the choice whether we want to go down that road or not or whether, or whether we want to incorporate what they call alternative medicine which i call medicine that's been there since the beginning of time that we're just beginning to understand yeah. and and incorporate that in with it but the most important thing is not just to survive through it. There's days you're going to survive, but to look at it, I'm going to thrive through this. I'm mm -hmm. going to come out the other end, a lawful lot stronger, not just healthier, not just cancer three, but I'm going to discover how courageous, how strong, how many abilities have, what I'm capable of facing. And all mm -hmm. of that is what you're working towards because when you come out the other side, you can see free. You're not the same person because you've discovered all these strengths. Absolutely. A hundred percent. So what was that realization for you with, you know, the first time you got, you're in remission and you feel, yes, it, it worked. Well, um, it took me a little while to absorb that yeah. truth. Um, and um, I was thrilled, of course. Yes. And to be honest with you, once I heard I was in remission, I, I assumed that that was behind me and I never had to think about it again. And to be honest, I really didn't, I didn't think a lot about it, um, except for one thing, as you said, I was a different person. Mm -hmm. So I had learned things. One thing I, that I learned is, um, you know, Sometimes when you hear some a, a friend or someone you know has gotten some bad news, it, it gets a little scary. And it's like, well, should I reach out to them? Yes. Or are they so devastated? They just want to be left alone. And, and I learned that um, our friends and loved ones, they need to stick around when we um, have something going on that's difficult. And the most important thing is just don't disappear. I mean, exactly. right at the top and say, I hear you're going through something hard. Please know I'm thinking about you. That gives the, per the person an opening to get back to you or yeah. text you back and, and keep, keep the co communication and the support going. Um, so uh, I became much more um, fierce about being in touch with people when I learned something's wrong, not just cancer, anything. Mm -hmm. And I learned when I had cancer that the best help that I got was when people, not when somebody said to me, I will do anything, just let me know what I need to do and I'll do anything for you. The best help was when somebody said to me, I'm planning on coming to your house at three o'clock tomorrow to do all of your laundry and yes. try it and fold it. Is three o'clock good for you or should I come a different time? Right. And you know, what, what I realized is that when someone is not at their best and if they're not well, don't give them another job to find an assignment for you, even though right. you think you're doing something yes. wonderful for them. Figure something out and just say, I'm going to do it. And if they say, you know what, thanks, but I have all clean laundry, but this is what I could. Yeah. Do you mind vacuuming? <laughs> exactly. exactly. So in the book, I have a whole section for, it's called well-meaning, for well-meaning friends and family. And it's, what do you say? What don't you say? Exactly. Um, what can you do for this person that will be helpful that might be a little bit out of the box? Because mm. support is huge and yes. uh, invaluable. I think, I think, you know, as I said, when people get the diagnosis, they kind of retreat into self. They don't know how to react. Other people don't know how to react. And that's how isolation happens. So this is when, you know, friends need to step up and just simply take your hand. I'm here for you. I know right. you're processing it. I'm here for you. 
Um, I have a show out this week on widowhood and it's that same type of thing. So many people don't approach the widow because they don't know what to say. And it's like sometimes just being there, just being there. So the person doesn't feel alone. Uh, you know, uh, whether you've lost someone or in, in a case of a diagnosis, you feel you're losing yourself, right? So you need to know that you've got that chain of support. And it's, if tell me what you need. Well, sometimes you don't know what you need. So as well, you said, be proactive and say, have you eaten, right? You know what? I'm going to cook you something Well, you go and have a shower, right? right. And, and it's kind of a little assertiveness because the person is in flux and when you're in flux you're not thinking clearly and if you ask them what do you want they really don't know they just don't want cancer thank you <laughs> right okay absolutely you've got a way to delete that program please you know uh but it's that take a little charge while they're gathering themselves until they can be back in charge of themselves absolutely i couldn't agree more you know I mean, cancer i don't know what 40 years ago used to be kind of a rare disease and now we see it so much. And the reason why I say 80, 20 is because it has been associated a great deal with trauma, with emotion, with anxiety. You know, when we get ourselves so anxious and we're in de-stress, you know, all the time, that distress leads to disease somewhere in your body. It's going to pick the weakest area and start breaking it down. And whatever that disease is that comes out heart, a number of things, you know, that, uh, huge these days that we never used to hear about like fibromyalgia mm -hmm. and none of these things they all come about from stress and some form of maybe trauma that we haven't dealt with and that and then there is that 20 percent environmental which is the foods you put in the environment that we're around because we're around so many cancerous products today yes. that it is awful and i suppose you know one thing is buy uh and purchase your goods both to go in and around you by reading the labels and knowing what is cancerous and what is it. They're not going to tell you on the labels, this may cause cancer. But, you know, if you can't pronounce the name, then maybe you need to look it up and what it is. That means your makeup, your soaps, your shampoos, you know, your cleaning products, and look at what the ingredients in there, are they detrimental to your health, right? And then look for something else that isn't because we can take control to a large point um, what we put in and on our body and around us, uh, which covers that 20%. But when it is an internal emotion, that is something that we've got to go down to the root cause and find out what it is, right? So did you have anything on your discovery when you had the cancer of why did I get this? You know, is it in the family? Is there something I need to face and release? Mm. Um. Well, it, 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 there was not a hereditary um, link as far as I know. Mm -hmm. I've had relatives with cancer, but different kinds. I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, and that was, um, does not necessarily tend to be hereditary. Um, I, I will tell you that um, I moved 10 years ago from New York City, from New York City to a little town called Ocean Grove, New Jersey. And I lived steps from the beach. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason I did that was to reduce the stress in my life. I've had a very busy, my, my whole working life, I've been very busy with my work. And, um, you know, there are stresses related to any yeah. occupation. And um, so over the last several years, and really I've had two iterations of cancer since I moved here, 2017 and 2018, but I have made a huge effort to reduce the stress in my life. And um, I think that that has made a difference and is making a difference. I also, um, you know, 23 years ago, when I first was diagnosed, one of my first questions was, well, why did this happen to me? I've only been married two years. And yes. I, in some ways, my this chapter of my life has just started. Yeah. And now I have this cancer, I could die. Um, and 
you may be a little surprised by this. Um, so I would think, you know, why is this happening to me? And then to be honest with you, I had this thought, it was like, well, why not me? I'm not so special. Mm -hmm. um, if you, if we look around, you know, people are facing very hard things every day. And the reason that that has been very valuable to me is that I, it has helped me not be angry. Anger right. is terrible for your health. Mm -hmm. And it has helped me be grateful for, oh my gosh, I'm grateful for my little dog. I'm grateful for my home. I'm grateful for my friends. Um, uh, so I, I, I think that my, I have very much changed in my attitudes towards those things yes. since my diagnosis. I, you know, we were saying this beforehand, maybe a bit to do with age where, you know, kind of, we get to a point where we don't have time for BS or drama, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, we want to be productive and meaningful. You know, that purpose is a different type of purpose now than what it used to be when we were younger or when we were, you know, had children. I'm a grandmother now, two small babies. I had to wait until 66 to become a grandma. And oh, so, congratulations. You know, so now I've got two of them and, you know, oh, turning three wonderful. and turning one. And uh, I just came back from the weekend with them. And it, <clears throat> there's something different about being a grandma and you know it's it's I can give them back and the sense is is that I'm not responsible for them 24 7 right, right. I had three <laughs> kids sorry I had three kids my husband worked a lot he was not a hands-on parent and so you know you're on 24 7 and, you know, if you took a day off, something disastrous would happen. So you didn't take many days off. And right, uh, right. you don't get overtime. You don't get anything else in motherhood, right? <laughs> you know? And so, I f and then an unhappy marriage. So I think that, you know, all of that accumulated and eventually manifested itself in, in a form of a disease. And I think that now being a grandmother, um, with the wisdom, you slow down, you look at what's really important, Yes, they need food, diaper changing, this, that, et cetera. But it's that love, it's that support, that time to have with them. And I think we just reach an age where it is, yeah, life is buzzing all around me and I'll slip into the streams I want to be mm -hmm. a part of on those streams I don't want to be a part of. I'm coming out and it's a little more, yes, bodies can't keep up like it did 20, 30, 40 years ago, but at the same time, Everything about us has slowed down in a way to appreciate the moment more, capture the Absolutely. moments more. And I think that's, if only we knew that back then, mm -hmm. right? It, you know, perhaps we wouldn't have got to such a stress level that triggered all these other things. And that mm -hmm. if you can take anything away from today, which I hope you take many things away, is like it's okay to slow down and, Absolutely. you know, savor the pasture that you're going through have a nibble, meet people along the way. Don't be in a rush to get to the next field. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, that is definitely one of the advantages of age. I'm, I'm grateful that I've lasted these 23 extra yes, years. Yes, yes. Because um, I have different priorities. Mm -hmm. And... My diagnoses and my journeys uh, through through cancer, they are they were actually very valuable in helping me reprioritize. And this could sound a little silly, but it helps me. Um, I love beautiful glass. I see you have some beautiful glass. Yes, fruit. <laughs> yes, yes. And, love crystally well, type I, things. Yes. So I um, bought some very beautiful little glass cherries, about five of them. And I put them in a pretty little bowl and I keep it out on my counter um, because it doesn't remind me every day, but often it reminds me that, you know, if I am healthy, I have love in my life, whether it's it, whatever kind of love it is, however, you know, my friends, my family, um, I have a roof over my head. I'm not worried about the next meal. You know, my life really is a bowl of cherries. Yes. And a little physical reminder, mm. I have to tell you, it's very helpful. And, and that is a direct result 
of having been through some very rough times physically and emotionally. Yeah. So I'm grateful for that new knowledge and those new priorities. Yes, it it's to, I call it looking at the sunny side of the street. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been on the other side. I've been in the dark alley, right? right. I know what it's like is to be consumed by that and the effort it takes to come out and get onto that road where you're out into the sunlight, you're blinded. You feel the shadows are chasing you. But as you step more into the sunny side of the street, you read the shadows are giving contour and meaning to the light. And then you can go back into the dark uh, and be the light in there. But it's that it's that coming out of that turmoil and kind of stepping into that light and then truly feeling the warmth the warmth of love and the warmth of light and, and not taking it for granted, but mm -hmm. seeing it and feeling it in a way that you absorb it differently. And it gives you a different form of energy. Yes, absolutely. I feel that way about sunlight. I literally, when I feel the sun on my skin, I can, I feel like a human battery just <laughs> yes. in and absorbing all of that wonderful energy. And water does that. I mean, you said just steps away from the water. Absolutely. Water, water is an incredible thing. conduit. It's a wonderful way to receive things, whether you're in your shower. You know, yeah. well, some things that I do now and again is I tap EFT, emotional freedom thing, and tap while I'm in the shower because the water amplifies. And, uh, and, it, and it really is a wonderful thing to do um, when you just feel, you know, stressed up, have a little chat. <laughs> you know, I know you're there, chat, <laughs> there's stress. But, you know, although I acknowledge you and I understand why you're there, but I'm, I'm going to go over to calm. Thank you. And, uh, and then you can step out of that shower with calmness and not just cleansiness, but you feel you've washed away. Right. You've washed things away. Right. So you have, were just married when this first happened to you. I was. Uh, but there's been no mention of husband since. Is he still with you? Oh, no. Um, we were married a little over 10 years, and he died very suddenly following oh. surgery. Um, so that was um, – but those were the best 10 years of my life, although yeah. my life is pretty great right now. Yeah. But um, I didn't marry till I was 45, but, but – uh, my husband and I, you know, it was it was an, a, a normal marriage. There were ups and downs and yes. lots of things. But um, yeah, so I um, I have been through, you know, widowhood. I, yes. I to be honest with you, when you mentioned that, um, I more people stayed away from me after my husband died than stayed away from me after I was diagnosed with cancer, yeah. which was sort of a surprise, but. Um, you know, a lot of them, they were just, it's a terrifying thing and they didn't know how to deal with it. Exactly. They, they're all still in my life, or at least most of them. Who, yeah. You know, I, who and that's, you know, that's the reason why I do these shows is, is, you know, for people to actually understand when somebody has a loss, you know, loss of a spouse, a loss of a child, even a loss of a pet, you, you know, mm -hmm. do not you know, underestimate how much pain it is to lose a pet. The one behind me on the wall, I lost seven years ago, but she's still very, very much with me, right? Yeah. And I still miss her so much. I actually got her to replace my husband. And so <laughs> she was the best choice I made, right? So, and, sorry? The dogs. What's yes, the dog? she's a Border Collie. She was named Kokomo. And Kokomo. she, she just, uh, I mean, you know, um, just talk about a child that knew, knew your soul, Right. Yeah, my little Maxie is over here. I got, I adopted her um, shortly after my husband died. I'd never had a dog before, and now Maxie and I've been together longer than I was married to my husband. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and uh, she, she is my constant companion. Yes. I never knew. I had no idea how extraordinary dogs are until yes. I got Maxie. I know. Sorry yeah. that at Kokomo. Uh, oh, I know, and and uh, I will get another dog. I'm in transition right now. I will be moving closer to my daughter, but they're just having some issues finding a place. And my son's getting married this year, late, you know, just before his 40th birthday, he's getting married. Oh, and uh, so after all of that, I'm going to get myself a little dog, but I haven't got the energy for a border collie anymore. So I want a lap dog. I want a dog that wants to snuggle up with me, right? <laughs> That's a great idea. Yes. That's a great idea. Yeah. And, and uh, um, recently I, I launched a book, I've Forgotten Children, which is an anthology with 15 um, 
15 people in it around the raising of our children and what we need to do differently. And I was at my son's house while I was doing this and the cat was on my lap. I was eight hours uh, live streaming on the day we launched it. Uh-huh. And, uh, and so the cat was on my lap and every now and again, you just see a tail <laughs> going across the scene. <laughs> That's adorable. And she just thought, oh, no, a lap. She's sitting still. She's not going anywhere. I'm going to plunk myself on top of her. <laughs> <laughs> she loved it but they are great companions and and you know when we lose them it's 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 um it's just as heartbreaking and people go oh no it's only a pet no you have to understand it's a heart and soul that is so honest and so pure right that it is it's it's another loss and it's okay to feel the loss it's okay to grieve right you know one thing i said in the other show is we've got to be careful we don't get stuck in it we don't wallow in it like, right. you know, as I said, so many people die from the diagnosis that they get because they immediately step into victimhood, right? right? And if it's like, yes, you know, you've been dealt what I call a cosmic two by four, mm-hmm. right? Beautiful. And, it, and yeah. it's like, but the question the cosmic is asking you is what are you going to do about it, right? right? You know, um, uh, I'm reminded of Viktor Frankl writing um, Man's Search for Meaning. And, um, you know, he said, he was a great psychiatrist, and um, he said that the one power that cannot be taken away from a human is the power to choose how they will react to yes. the circumstance. Yeah. That's our so choice. Talking- it's That's so our choice. And and we have to catch ourselves because our human reaction is to immediately get into ah, flight mm. or fight or box somebody, you know, and it's or feel wounded or attacked. And very often we go to say, you know, I like um, Don Roos for agreements. Mm-hmm. Speak your word with integrity. Don't assume. Ask. Mm-hmm. Assumption is deadly as is mm-hmm. comparison. They're deadly. Because in your assumption, you're assuming it from your perspective, not from the truth of what it is, right? And don't take things personally. You know, there's two reactions. If somebody's dumping on you, it is they're just dumping on you all their angst and you're there. You don't have to absorb it. But at the same time, you can question, hmm, I must have let my energy down that they felt free enough to come and dump on me. Maybe Hmm. I need to rise that frequency up again. And then just... Do your very best by not somebody else's standard, your own, that you can lay your head on the pillow and go, you know what? I gave it my all today. The best that I could give, I gave it my all. And that's all I needed to do. Right. Right. One, that's all so wise, so helpful. You get up the next day with gratitude in your heart. I'm awake. Mm -hmm. I have another day in front of me. (laughs) You know, I just learned recently that in um, observant Judaism, um, the first thing that a person who is observant does every morning when they wake up, there's a prayer where they thank God for waking them up. Yes. yes. And that starts your day yes. with an attitude of thankfulness because it's the first thing you said when you woke up. Right. I love that. I'm not a person that the alarm goes off and I jump out of bed. I like to open my eyes and greet the day. Hello, day. What have you got in front of me? All right. And uh, let let my night go and let my day begin. And then I kind of have a process of going into the day. Um, I think, you know, you, the old hare and the rabbit story, you know, used to be the hare. I had a vision of what I wanted to see happen and I wanted to do it immediately and get to that finish line, open the doors to my vision. And I didn't always have the skills or the tools to do it. Right. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. I've become the tortoise. I'm loving being the tortoise. Maybe it's because I'm six months off 70. I don't know. Or maybe being grandma or maybe just slowing down in life. But the people you meet along the way, as I said, the pasture, you know, where where the juicy pieces of grass or berries are. Right. And, And instead of rushing past everything. And I think if we could all just slow down. Our bodies, I'm sure if you reflected, your body was trying to tell you something and you just didn't listen because you were too busy. Probably. I, I, I was definitely very busy. And when I say that, um, I mean that literally, but I also, that was part of my identity. 
Mm. I, I got something out of being very busy all the time. And um, when I was stopped in my tracks and not allowed to be so busy, that helped me see that, again, there's a balance. Being busy is good. But yes. it's if you're busy 100% of the time. And what are you busy doing? Is it all urgent? Or are you being busy sometimes just to be busy? <laughs> to, to look like you're busy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, which we're inclined to do, right? We're inclined to do that when we kind of look like we're busy. And, you know, and I think that sometimes by slowing down, taking that breath, greeting the day, do what you need to do in the day right? Do what you need to do. Don't load yourself up with more. Uh, and, and don't worry about putting things off for tomorrow. Uh, because, you know, tomorrow is good enough to do what needs to be done today, right? Today, what's urgent today? That doesn't mean it has to be all done today. And I think mm -hmm. we just learn to slow down, enjoy life more. And that I think is so important, because if we don't enjoy life, or what are we doing here? Right. You know, um, I can be a worrier. I've, mm. I've been able to shed a lot of that over the years, but I can still get very worried about things. And um, particularly after my husband died, I started getting worried about everything from the condition of my house to how to my old age. And again, I, I after a while, I had this thought, which was, I decided to make a worry appointment every morning at eight o'clock. Oh, I like this. And um, so I was, I, at eight o'clock, I would sit down and think about what I had been worried about the day before or what I was worried about at that moment. And then my assignment was to do whatever I could that could have a real effect on my worry that could accomplish something real. Yes. But once that was done, or if there was none, nothing like that for that day, then I, whenever I started to worry, I was to save that worry for my next appointment at eight o'clock the next morning. And that has been very helpful. I like that. Yes. Just like being CEO, worry is, is part of your job. Right, CEO of your life, CEO of your disease, CEO of everything, and just say, "Sorry, worry, you missed the appointment this morning. You're having to wait until next week, <laughs> next week or tomorrow, tomorrow, right? You know, because exactly. yeah, yeah, you know, and and you know, it's <clears throat> cancel that worry. But like, sometimes it's good to look at what you're worried about. Oh, for like, sure. But yeah, that sometimes is it just a you know a, a residual worry or worry that you know worry for the worry's sake type of thing, and that's you know what we need to look at. Like this free floating anxiety. Yes. You know, and I, that's why when I realized if there was something I could do that day that would help ease the problem yeah. or alleviate the problem or prevent the problem, you know, if I had an old boiler and I was worried about it, you know, flooding my house, well, then that day I could actually make an appointment to get a new boiler or yes. start putting aside money to get a new boiler, whatever, yes. but to do something concrete and yes. then let it go until the next worry appointment exactly i like that i'm going to take that up because worry likes to follow me for an appointment and bugs me at the wrong times <laughs> so yes I, i'm not going to give it only once a week though there you go <laughs> <laughs> Once a week, you've got five that, minutes. <laughs> I would never remember for a week, but that's a good thing too. Yes, because yes. if you can't remember what you were about a week ago, <laughs> obviously it's either been solved or it was not going to happen in the first place. Exactly, and I think you know if we have a tendency of that, you know, is are we a worry water? Or are we just seeing so many things that need to be done? And you know, like that CEO is an overseer. Right. They see all the departments and all the things that need to be done. And if they don't see everything, how can they address everything? Right. Well, so, you know, part of that worry is kind of that role of the CEO. And we have to look at it. Is it unnecessary worry? Is it worry for worry's sake? Or is there something to be concerned about? Absolutely. Well, you know, that that reminds me. Um, I part of my job as CEO at one point was to make sure that two doctors, each of whom had a different approach. One was a kidney doctor, and I wasn't even in the hospital for a kidney problem. It was for cancer. Um, 
wanted to do a procedure on me. And my oncologist was um, on vacation. And, and I was the person who had to make sure that the kidney doctor spoke to my oncologist yes. and got his input because, um, because we are not supposed to live in a silo. And in medicine, yeah. there are so many silos. And so I remember thinking and saying to somebody, you know, I'm the general contractor. If, <laughs> if the kidney doctor is the plumber and my oncologist is the electrician, I'm the general contractor and it's my job to make sure that I don't get electrocuted. Oh. <laughs> the best way for that <laughs> is to make sure that they're talking to each other. And again, to just facilitate what needs to be done, even if they don't agree. One doctor was not interested in getting the other doctor's opinion. She wanted to perform an operation, but I had to agree to it. And so, you know, um, it's it's very important to be that CEO and that general contractor and, um, you know, do a good job. Exactly. Um, I have on this week, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Teal, Dr. Timothy Teal, second time having him on. And he was an ear, nose and uh, throat doctor for many years. And he started discovering what was aggravating various throat issues and that instead of drugs or operations or anything else is that he started talking to people about eliminating certain things from their diet and then they would come back and the problem would be resolved wow. and so he started incorporating this in his practice and uh, they went after him they said no you've got to stick to medicine and he actually ended up with a, a lawsuit against him blacklisted and so he left medicine in that way and now practices it in the other way in the form of diet and EFT and, and uh, you know, the, the mental spiritual health on your body and that looking at the prevention and even if you do get what can we do organically, you know, right. before needing a doctor or, you know, or surgery or anything, because we've got to understand the medical business is a business. Now that they've forgotten that the business is the survival of patients. Well, right? yeah. <laughs> and in my, case, now, you know? in my case, the kidney doctor woke me up at 6.30 in the morning and described two procedures and said, you need one of them, which one do you want? And, I'm kidding. No. And I said, I'm not even here for a kidney issue. I'm here for cancer. And she goes, well, I'm you, your kidney. You've got a problem. And this is what how it can. And, and I need to do this before next week. So which one do you want? And I said, what does my oncologist think? And she said, this is not about cancer. I said, you know what? I want my oncologist to weigh in. And he did. And he actually said what was what I had asked her, which is, why not, why not give it some time and see if it self-corrects when we're right. doing some other things to address the cancer? And um, she was very unhappy with me, but I did not have the procedure. And when I saw my oncologist afterwards and we were talking about it I, I said to him you know which procedure would you have suggested if I if you did think I needed it and I was shocked when he suggested the one that I was not going to choose I had thought well if I have to which one will I do it turns out if I had chosen the one that was my instinct to choose without talking to my oncologist I would have been prone to even more infection mm -hmm. and um, it would have been a very, very dangerous situation. And, you know, but uh, I mean, I, this particular doctor was just more, in, she wanted to do a surgery without letting me do my due diligence. Mm -hmm. And I had to remember there I am in this can in this the hospital bed, not even awake, wearing a hospital gown. And this very official person has woken me up and told me what I have to do. And I kept saying, you know, be strong, Michelle, say yes. no. Be the CEO. Tell her you want to learn X, Y, and Z. You don't want to decide now. And um, I think that it helped save my life. Yes. You know, medicine today is extraordinary. Look at the prosthetics. Look at, you know, heart transplants. Look at lung transplants. Look at all the things that we can do medically. And it certainly has its place. But what so it is not about is prevention. And what it is not about is treating the whole people right. specialize 
in this department, that department, and they kind of feel, well, there's no connection with the rest of the body. Well, if you're not paying attention to the whole body, right, then, you know, you're leaving something out that's going to be in distress and then we'll have issues as well. So uh, we uh, I interviewed a doctor, a surgeon a few weeks ago, where he was talking about what he's advocating is that when somebody has a diagnosis and needs an operation, that there is a nurse assigned to them to see them through all of the modalities that they need oh, to go wow. through. It's having that oh. continuity, going back to the doctor, saying make sure that everybody's on the same page, where's the patient at, and until that patient is finally cured and fine, and then they can go, okay, off the list. But And they said, yes, it will cost a little bit more money, but in the end, it will save money because half the time the left and the right do not know what's going on and you know how many malpractices are there every year right where you could just have a nurse that's assigned to maybe 10 patients at a time or whatever and that continuity of what's going on and he said it would just make life so much better for all the doctors and so much better for the patient Absolutely. because they have somebody there navigating them through a maze that very often they have no comprehension of right right system has to change right and unfortunately it has become very much a money type system rather than you know than a healing type system and this is again back to your health is your choice yes you you know your um, your doctor and you went through this together but you decided your mindset was going to be part of the healing right that you were going to step up and manage it you were going to step up and face it and do what needed to be doing you got to keep the positive attitude and if we don't have that attitude, no matter what we're dealing with, right, we we are succumbing to the illness rather than managing it. Right. Right. Absolutely. So the same attitude when you got it back again, and I assume that when you got it back again, the second and third time, it wasn't as long or to heal. Um, was it a quicker? Uh, uh, that's true. Um, so the second time I got it back. I, I had this a second type of um, treatment. I had chemo and I went into remission and then it came back um, nine months later. And by this time there was no medication available because the um, uh, this particular type of lymphoma, there are only two chemos to treat it and you can't repeat one uh, oh. because the lymphoma tends to um, mutate to become mm. impervious to it. Right. So um, I ended up having something called a CAR T infusion where my stem cells were taken out of my body, sent to a company and re-engineered mm. and put back in and became little dive bombers to um, attack the lymphoma directly. And that didn't work either. So now I was really in trouble, but um, I eventually did go into remission. My oncologist um, suggested a different approach, um, still, you know, a medication, but, um, and it has worked. So I'm in my fifth year of remission um, and, um, you know, I, I, to be honest, now I'm thinking about cancer a lot because of, of the book. Um, <laughs> book, for sure. Yes. But I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about cancer. I, I, um, I spend a lot of time living my life. Yeah. And, and of course, in, in writing the book, yes, you're thinking about it, but you're thinking about it from survival prospect, not from being, you know, a victim of it. Yeah. Right. Well, and also, to be honest with you, so this is, it's not a memoir. This is a book I couldn't find when mm. I first learned, like, yeah. I, and, and um, I wanted a book, I didn't want a memoir, I didn't want one book about a particular cancer. I want somebody to say, okay, this happened to me too, mm. and I'm going to walk you through the process. You know, what? how like do I manual. do a period? And then how do I find a doctor? How do I interview doctors? How yes. do I remember that I'm hiring a staff? Mm. I don't just take the first doctor that comes along if I'm not comfortable. What are the criteria? If so, um, so you know, I'm hopeful that... Um, so when I was writing the book, I... I loved writing the book because I 
really, um, it's, it would have helped me if it yes. had been 20 years yes. ago. I, and that really is part of the problem, isn't it? When anybody gets any diagnosis of anything, mm -hmm. it's like, well, what is it really? What is it really doing? What, what am I empowered to do? How do I ask the right question? Mm -hmm. And again, is by knowing all of this, not only uh, does the doctor A, take you more seriously, but appreciates the fact that you've come in with, okay, I've done the research. Is it this? Is it that? How can we approach this? And they can see you're being proactive over your own health. Yes. Uh, and that's yes. that's something you have to be proactive over your own health. And, you know, um, what I've learned is, you know, it doesn't need to be adversarial with the doctor. Sometimes the doctor will get a little annoyed if, if they feel like they're, you know, you're asking too many questions or whatever. And I have learned, first of all, that maybe that's not the doctor for me. And second of all, um, you know, if I can just treat that doctor neutrally like like a colleague that yes. doctor will often turn around and start treating me like a colleague yes and, um yes. you know there's more of that in our control than we realize too if we get defensive if then then the doctor is going to get defensive or vice versa yeah. and we can break that cycle right at yes. the very beginning right and, you know, to gain to, to know that it's not, you know, all the, the doctor stuff. I mean, if you've got a doctor who says, no, 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 you can't do anything alternative, don't change your diet. You don't want that doctor. You want your doctor to go, yes, let's look at what you're doing. You know, before you take that, let's look to see if it's going to be a conflict. If you're changing your diet, changing your attitude, go for it. This is how we're going to get through it. Um, you want a doctor that is your cheerleader, but also works with any choices you're making outside of what they're prescribing. Well, honestly, um, after my, well, I had to turn down a stem cell transplant three times. And trust me, oncologists are not happy when they tell you your only choice is a stem cell transplant. And I say, I actually have, I, I'm quite familiar with that. And I am not criticizing it at all. I know people who it's been great for, but it's not for me. And and doctors have just looked at me and their jaw dropped because you don't say no to your doctor, particularly when it's the only, they think it's the only alternative. And you know what? Um, I was educated. I knew the risks that I was taking, but I also knew where my line in the sand was. Mm -hmm. And I also knew that I was going to, I had to listen to myself yes. as much as I needed to listen to someone I was hiring to advise me. Yeah, exactly. And that's what it's all about. A CEO takes in all the information and then has to make a deduction based on what they've learned. Exactly. And a CEO doesn't just take it in, they ask questions so that they can deduce you know, the answer because ultimately um, the make or break is on the CEO's shoulders. That's right. right? So that's yeah, why you've got to know how to ask the, the questions. Yeah. Right. They have the most to gain or the yes. most to lose. Yes. And that's true for me. It's true for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cancer is 100% survivable. Um, and again, like with so many, I mean, you know, even look with, with COVID, the first people that got COVID, many died and many ended up with long-term problems. Or, But now we look at COVID, they're now just putting it under the flu bracket. Mm -hmm. And there's so many variants of it because it, it got weaker. Uh, mm -hmm. So it wasn't a killer anymore. It got weaker, but we don't even know. Do we have a cold? Do we have a variant? Do we have COVID? We don't know anymore. And the thing is, if you're worrying about it, all right, if you're panicking about it, you are putting your body on high alert where it should be there working for your immune system in preventing anything happening to you. So th the more that you kind of just calm down and look at things rationally, get as much information and don't sensationalize anything. Don't panic right don't assume right uh, and if it's like you know this is a concern i haven't got any more uh, information here when i see the doctor i'm going to take this in and ask them to explain it to me right yes absolutely um i think you're right on target you know it's it's we have the most to gain and the most to lose we have an important job we need to do that job responsibly yes we need to be a good employer um not a tyrant mm -hmm. but we also need to know what our own priorities are and and then 
listen to ourselves. And um, most of us have pretty good instincts if we really listen to ourselves deep exactly. down. Exactly. Exactly. It, it's not the outside chatter, it's the inside. What resonates with the inside? Yes. Right? And, you know, here's something else. You know, in life in general, I am more willing to pay the price for a decision or a choice that I make that turned out not to be the right choice. Yes. Pay the price for the choice that somebody else made on yeah. my behalf. Yeah. That I'm paying the price for. Yeah. Um, I have a disease and I um, and it's it's an ongoing one. It's not a, you have to, you can only manage it. You can't cure it. Um, mm -hmm. So but what it is, it is it to um, it's my partner. Right. And it's a, it is that compass. It lets me know. Nope. Nope. You're overdoing it. Nope. Yeah. You've, you've got to go relax or take some time out. If not, I will flatten you. And it does. You know, I just whoop. Well, that's it flattened but, um, but I've got to pay attention to the signs if I pay attention to the signs and I stay within those parameters it's there uh, it's discomfort uh, but it's it allows me to go and do what I need to do and what I want to do as long as I pay attention now I am somebody with a disease I am not the disease right, right? It's traveling with me. It's my challenge in life as with anybody who maybe wears glasses or people who have no limbs or whatever. It's a challenge that I live with. And as long as you learn to, to know your, your limitations and where you need to pull back, you know, pay attention, um, you'll, you can manage your life. And so that's the thing is, is looking at it. Yes, it sucks. And that's what I like your, your title. Cancer sucks. Yes. Right. Yeah. It does. But what are you going to do about it? exactly and that's the important thing. why coffee cups on the on the book cover i'm fascinated by that <laughs> well my interpretation is that it's one of the coffee cups has written on it trust me i've been there mm -hmm. cancer sucks but you'll get through it and it's let's sit down and just have a cup of coffee i'm gonna i want to go through this with you i you know let's just talk tell me some of your fears let me see if I can say anything or impart something that could help you. So it was, that's the intent. I'm not I sure. Know, I know. I like that. I like that that's analogy. Yeah. Let's just have a chat about it. Let's chill out, have a chat, have a cup of coffee. And you know, you're not alone. You're not alone. That's it. Yes. That's it. You're not alone. There yeah. are two cups there, not just one for you. And, you know, for people, who even haven't got cancer to know and read this book or have it just on your bookshelf for it, it again it's like i'll go back with your forgotten children it doesn't matter if you're a parent or you work with children knowing what's going on in the society it means less judgment and assumption from your side and and where and knowing where you can step up and help in situations right so we don't have to wait until we've got cancer to know this we generally know somebody that's going through something cancer or something else so having this book on hand and reading this book ah oh, so and so's just been diagnosed with that i know what to do now i know mm -hmm. how to help now and that's you know our bottom line is we're all here to help each other that's right? exactly right we are and i'm i um it helps to be reminded of that so mm -hmm. thank you and the the beauty of it is you know i i look at life i want to bring the village back and everybody in that village is as, is as important as each other and when mm -hmm. somebody's down the village is there to pick them back up and there's a celebration oh. everyone's there to celebrate and i think if we could bring back our village mentality and oh. you know and be that support for each other be that strength for each other we'll see that strong village that strong community where everybody feels a part of something. They feel seen, heard, and counted, and know that they have something to contribute and they can participate and it will be valued. And I think that is a great healing thing and a great way of bringing us all together. Don't yes, let the do. person go through what they're going through alone. Step up. Do you need a shower? Do you need a bite to eat? Let's go out for a walk. Uh, I'm going to do your laundry. Uh, let's, uh, let's vacuum for you. Whatever the case is, no, you don't know what to say. Come in and say, I don't know what to say right now. If I say something wrong, tell me. It's not out go. of malice, right? right? But I'm stepping up and I'm going to help you. Do you know what you want? No? Okay, I'm going to see what you need. Dishes in the sink, right? You, <laughs> you know, and just be a little proactive because that person's out there low right now. 
Mm -hmm. right? But it's also, don't just pay attention to them either when they've had a loss or they've just got the diagnosis and they're just starting their treatment. This is ongoing, right? Grief for a spouse or, or the whole process of going through trauma, um, you know, through cancer and treatment and everything else is be there for them through it. No, you can't be there all the time. Nobody expects you to. But maybe you have the group of friends that say, okay, I did this last week. Who can step in this week? Right? And tag team each other. Right? You know, and I also, uh, something that helps me. So uh, for some reason, I always feel like if there's a problem and I am aware that I have to solve it. Yes. And it doesn't always serve us well because it's good to remember, you know, you're not going to solve the problem for your friend. Your friend doesn't expect that or yeah. it's not looking for that. But for you to just be there, yeah, just the ear, just be yeah. the arm around their shoulder. That's enough. And yeah. things will progress from there very naturally. Be the energy they haven't got. Yes, that's beautiful. Right. Mm -hmm. and, let, and help them turn that volume back up on their own energy. Right. So I, I mean, that goes back to it. I always draw the analogy that we're in discovery of what our instrument is. And once we know what that instrument is, we learn how to play it and we can play it well as a soloist. But when we come to the orchestra, each one of us in our own strength and we decide to work harmoniously together, we transcend in a way that reaches so many people through our symphony. So, you know, we're only as strong as we are in a relationship. You know, nobody's there to complete you compliment mm -hmm. you yes not complete you um but it is finding our own strength and how we can be a part of that orchestra and if you know if somebody's strings are broken or somebody's having a bad day how do we pick that person up so that we can hear them again the way they feel a part of it again because when you're playing that, that orchestra one person goes off you hear it right so it's the game back to the village back to the orchestra when everybody's fruitful everybody wins so beautiful so, my dear, how do people get hold of the book? How do they get hold of you? And what are you offering, um, if uh, anything? Can people call you? Can they have a chat with you? I'm on Facebook, Michelle Rapkin. And I'm hoping that people will be in touch with me with um, their own responses, their own questions, anything. I'm about to get on Instagram. I'm sort of late to the party on both of those things. Um, the book is available on the web, any of your, you know, Barnes and Noble, Amazon.com, hopefully your local bookstore. Um, so hopefully it's not going to be hard to get. <laughs> and and uh, um, do you want to give your email or not? Or you just want people to go sure, through Facebook? My email is m. Rapkin, R A P K I N, at Mac, M A C dot com. And I welcome, welcome, welcome emails. I answer everyone. And as I said, you should do Amazon Barnes and Nobles. All you do is put in Cancer Sucks, but you'll get through it by Michelle Rapkin. And yeah. as I said, it doesn't matter if you have cancer or not. It doesn't matter. It, it is whatever you're facing. You uh, know, you're right. to know how to ask the questions, to know how to ask for support, to know how to be supportive. Yes, right. absolutely. I believe there is always a reason, there's always a cure. And yes, for some people, it is sometimes what they face is the end of their days. Mm -hmm. So, and they know it. So well, how about we celebrate their life before they go? Absolutely. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, we honor a baby when it comes into the world. Why can't we honor people as they're going out? Right. I couldn't agree. So thank you so much for sharing with us here today, Michelle. I'm glad that you wrote this book. It is what people do need um, because that, I think, is the biggest fear. The diagnosis, now what do I do about it? And you've got these white coats lording over you with big words and decide we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and you feel helpless. Right. And I think step up and be your own CEO. It's okay for you to ask questions. And if a doctor doesn't want to um, uh, do that, here, unfortunately, in British Columbia, we have a million people without a doctor. So it's mm -hmm. a little hard for us to get a doctor, never mind another doctor. Uh, yeah. But it don't always rely just on doctors. There are so many other healing modalities out there, of which I have done many shows on cancer. All you have to do is just put up 
you know, cancer stories here on selfdiscoverywisdom.com and all the shows I've done on cancer myself are there. Um, and it's what can you do? How can you be proactive? But the most important thing is you are the CEO. This is your body. This is your life. You have every right to ask questions, every right to pursue different avenues and every right to know what's happening to your body and how you can make the right decisions for your company. Yes. <laughs> Oh, that's so beautifully put. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. And thank you very much. And and may that remission be forevermore. Thank right? you so much. It's B17 just really formula, fun. the vitamin B17 is actually known as the cancer Pac-Man. I've actually I got it's that under B17? the cancer thing. B17, I have and B17 is is your your millet, your berries your almonds, oh. all of that. And actually, if you just if you go again to my site and put in B17, um, the the document will come up where it gives the complete list of everything. And it's just, it's a, what it does is cyanide, it's a cyanide vitamin, like a Pac-Man, it goes after the cells. I love and it. it's I, mean, the, I, and you, I eat six almonds a day, but I didn't realize that it was the B17. Exactly. So that up on your website Thank and you. also yeah. doctors don't want people to know about it because it's anti-cancer so you know so but it gives all the ratios uh, low medium and high of what you eat and so it is a preventative if something comes up i've literally known people to cure themselves with apricot seeds right mm -hmm. and a good attitude so I you know apricot seeds. exactly <laughs> and and it's right it's you know the, the thing is nature has given us Whatever disease it gives us, it gives us a cure a few feet away. And, to, you know, don't just be reliant on the doctors, work with the doctor, but also work with your own self as well. There are plenty of people out there that can help you on the other side of it. And so be proactive, be investigative and be in control, but don't forget to ask for help. Right. Absolutely. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. My thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, very important show. Very important book. And so, you know, um, I'm always promoting book clubs because I think they're great. We get different perspective, but I also promote podcast clubs where people Wonderful. listen to a podcast and then each one takes their notes and then talks about what they got out of it. What right? a great concept. And then now you've actually got this perspective, that perspective, and you've got a bigger picture. All right. And I and I think it's a great way to open conversations. So book clubs, podcast clubs, you know, and just keep the conversation going, please. All right. Okay. So until next time, folks, be well, be happy. We'll catch you later. We hope that you enjoyed the show. There are so many more for you here on selfdiscoverywisdom.com. Just go to the podcast tag at the top there and you will see all the many genres and all 3,000 shows ready for your listening. We are here to serve you, to help you on your journey of life. And we know that through inspiration, it begets invitation. We are supported by you, the listeners, and those that we interview. Anything that you can spare us in donation would be greatly accepted. And we do hope that you enjoy the next show.